I'm Jean Bonatel. I'm with Cornell Waste Management Institute, and I come at this whole thing from a little bit different, is that too high? Different perspective? I take the longest time. Good enough. Um, I come from a solid waste protect perspective, so we do a lot of composting and waste management. We're looking at the, the health effects, environmental effects of mortality disposal. And Josh went through these, so I'm not going to go through these um, too much. Contractor services is a possibility. Some people take, and I will mention that one because um, Josh didn't, but contractor services is one of those that people pay somebody to take it away, but you've got to make sure that they're disposing of it properly. Uh, we've had, we actually had a rendering, um, rendering situation where the company had shut down the render, or we had shut down that rendering company and somebody that worked for the rendering company took all of the cows that were being rendered and buried them on his sister's property. And it sort of didn't fit in our rules and regulations. We couldn't shut them down. The local community ended up having to shut it down. Uh, the local, local law ended up shutting it down, but, but it sort of fell through the cracks there with, um, with our state regulations. So that was a problem, and I've seen that again and again, where where uh, animals are taken for fee and they're just dis they're disposed of improperly. It's still your animal, and it has to be disposed of properly. So, and the other ones we talked about, digestion was another one, um, and we're talking about alkaline digestion, and most of the time that's saved for animals that have chronic wasting disease or BSE or. Um, scrapies, something like that, where it's a prion disease. Because it's so expensive and so hard to get rid of the, the leachate from that system. And that's a chemical digestion, not an anaerobic digestion. So it's a little bit different. I'll just do this. When we're thinking about the disposal, we've got to think about all of these things. Water, soil, air, and then traffic. If we're bringing a lot of animals on the site, we've got to look at that aspect as well. Um, with water, it's nutrients, biological oxygen demand, and pathogens. Uh, with soil, nutrients and pathogens. With uh, air, it's odor and emissions. <coughs> Traffic, noise, and dust. This is a burial pit. Not something we want to see. This was in a meridian of a highway where they were just disposing, just throwing deer in and letting them liquefy, kind of. So no pathogen kill. A good place for somebody to fall into. Not that somebody's going to walk in the middle of a highway meridian, but but you know there's a lot of potential there. It was pretty nasty. I'm going to cover a couple of things because what we do is when there are questions out there, we've been working on this for the last 15 years. On, on composting and burial and those things for the last probably 15 years. <clears throat> so I'm going to I'm going to highlight a couple of studies because what we try to do is to answer the questions so the regulators um, are satisfied with this is going to work in this situation, that's going to work in that situation, all of those kinds of things. So by accident, we um, ended up studying a burial situation. NRCS had put in a uh, three bin system or a, a one bin system, cement bin system, and the farm proceeded to use the bin as a just to dump the animals in. So we had animals in there and not enough carbon, no carbon layer underneath, and so they really was very much mimicking a burial situation. So we said, okay. EPA is not going to shut them down anytime soon. DEC is not going to shut them down anytime soon. We're going to study it because we don't have the force to be able to, to shut it down. So we did. And when this bin, cement bin was built, it had three or four holes that came out into, <coughs> into this filter strip. And what was supposed to come out of there, and if they had composted properly, they would have just had basically clean water coming out, or you know, some clean liquids coming out there, maybe a little bit of nu nutrient in them, and we'll talk about some of that as we go. But it would have been pretty clean. As it was, it killed the buffer strip, or the filter strip. And these are the reasons why it did that. So we put some collection pans right under those <coughs> holes so that we could study what was happening, and we did some soil sampling uh, in place as well. And as you can see, 
As you can see, um, of course, really high nitrogen for the most part. And we just looked at it, and it was a very, very hot summer, and that'll come into effect when we talk about the people of coliform. Um, <clears throat> high BOD, high pH, you know, it's, it's normal. Look at the fluorides here. Really, really high. And that's probably what killed between that and that. That's what we figured killed that whole buffer strip. Usually we'd be, we would be worried about pathogens in that situation, and, and we were. But this is how low our pathogens were. We were looking at fecal coliform there, and they were really, really low. And I mentioned before, these were 100 degree days. This was a really hot summer. And the only reason that we had such low pathogens in that situation was because the sun was actually killing the pathogens. The liquid would be coming out of the system. And there was such heat uh, because the soil was dark and everything, as you can see here, that it just wiped out the pathogens pretty much. In normal situations, in the bin itself, there were lots of pathogens because the, the uh, organisms were able to persist in that and were not killed. There was no heat in that system. There were very little heat in that system. We looked at the leachate that comes off the piles. So a lot of people are interested in the composting piles. So a lot of people are interested in what is the leachate, how much leachate comes off, and what's the quality of that. And we just had a question. If anybody has the answer to this, that would be great. We had a question from APHIS this week saying, how many gallons of fluid come off of a cow or a horse? And if anybody has that, you're, the UK thinks it's about four gallons because the blood coagulates, you know, if you think about what's happening in this pile, in these piles, the blood coagulates, so that's not running off unless there's open wound or open opening where it's actually coming out very early on in the process. But there are liquids that potentially can come out of that pile. We worked a lot with Department of Transportation because they wanted the answers to these questions. And this was on Long Island, which has a very shallow aquifer, so we couldn't make any mistakes here. We didn't want to pollute anything here because of the shallow aquifer. So they needed to know what was happening. So what we did was we um, set up <coughs> two trial piles, and we do a control, and we do an active pile. Uh, we lined that, obviously, then we built the piles, and um, in this case, it's really neat working with DOT because they have all of these tools. You know, they, we said we need a hole cut in the cement, they have cut a hole in the cement. We, you know, there are all these things that wash the cement so that everything, went, or the asphalt, so everything was clean. They did that, you know, so it was really quite nice working with them. Um, we built a pile, the control pile was just a pile of wood chips. And one of the reasons that we did that was because we have high path pathogen levels in plain wood chips. Now, it's going to depend on where you are and what they're exposed to. But we were totally um, surprised that there were such high levels in, in wood chips because all of us play with wood chips all the time. I mean, if we're mulching our plants and things like that, we may be using just a regular municipal wood chip. Why do they have such high pathogens? One of the reasons we figured out, we deduced, was that, you know, animals are living in the trees. Animals are, you know, pooping in the trees, all that kind of stuff. So that ends up being chipped, and all those pathogens are still in those piles. So they were actually higher than the pathogens that were associated with the deer. So the wood chips were contaminating our deer when we, when we did a lot of the roadkill work. Um, and, and that isn't said to scare people away from using wood chips or shavings or any of that kind of stuff. It's just to say, wash your hands when you're playing in them. Um, that's really what needs to happen. So the second pile had uh, four deer in it. And we looked at it over time and collected the leachate that would come off. And we tried to control the leachate with those plastic containments so that everything so, so that we minimize the amount of, of leachate that we're looking at to just what, what is in those piles. So in the beginning, this first one here, um, we've got a decent amount of things. So we've got the deer in here, chips, plain chips, deer, plain chips you can see right across. 
And here, we're seeing a lot of nitrogen come off. But remember, we were building the pile. We were dragging stuff onto the, onto the plastic. So we were contaminating. We were adding to this, these contaminations in the top here. Then we did it with natural rainfall. And as you can see, the, things, the, the levels of intensity that are coming off those piles are reducing quite a bit to below background levels. So we were not too worried about what was happening with, with those. We knew that the, the liquids that were coming off, the leachate that was coming off, was fairly innocuous and wasn't going to cause problems um, to the soil that these were placed on. Comparison of, of composting to burial. Now, um, these numbers are probably hard to see, but this is 8,000 and this is 800. Okay, so there's a 10 times difference between those two charts. When we compost, um, the nitrogen staying, pretty much staying in the pile. Any that's running off is running off very quickly. Um, and as I said, some of that's because we were walking on the surface and stuff like that. And we were careful, but we can only be so careful. And then, um, very well. When we look at burial, we're all over the map. It's going to be everywhere. And we don't have control over what's coming off when. When the rain is hitting, you're getting um, you're getting a lot of material or a lot of nutrients off of that. Um, Josh referred to some of the faded drugs work that we did, um, and we were looking at some similar stuff with do they break down because the vets are responsible for these animals when a dog gets into it. Um, or another animal gets into it and dies, there's a problem, and wild animals are getting into them, and we don't have a lot of control over that either. Uh, and as Josh said, when it comes to eagles and vultures and other things, there are real problems. So we were looking at that, um, and the vet school was really, really interested in us making sure that we were doing some of this work. They wanted to see if we were burying properly versus uh, composting, what was happening. Um, so we laid down the bed, do all that stuff. Um, again, the wiffle balls, they work pretty well and we can, we can study what the contents of those wiffle balls. We put some into a burial hole. We put some into the gut of the animal. Covered it up, collected the leachate, had good temperatures um, all the way through. So you can see our ambient line there is the red one down below. Um, so good temperatures in the beginning and then lower temperatures there. But as, as we've been finding out, um, those lower sustained temperatures work really well. And in the DOT stuff uh, that we were doing, we found that, and, and we're not recommending this to any policymakers or anything like that, but we found that even the piles that were low, that were at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, were still, over a long period of, of temperature, were still killing the pathogens that we needed to kill. So we were really pleased with that result. Not that that's what we want, a low temperature cook, but it's still working. So even when we do composting poorly, poorly, and I hate to recommend that, but even when we do it poorly, uh, we're still getting what we need from that. Um, pentobarbital levels in this study, and we've done a couple of studies, but in this particular study, um, again, down pretty low. But in this study, what we found was we, uh, it was leaving, but we weren't sure that it wasn't going to go into the soil. So we wanted to make sure and follow that. And that's why we started using the wood chips to absorb the material, the, the pentobarbital, so that we could actually see where it was going and trace it right through the system. Um, pent pentobarbital and the leachate was, was pretty low, so it was, wasn't running off the, um, the plastic sheeting. And so we were pretty pleased with that. This is um, seven, a horse seven months afterwards. Uh, Josh showed us a lot of great pictures there. We were also looking at, um, at phenylbutazone, which is an NSAID. Uh, it's like, like your uh, ibuprofen. 
just is to make animals comfort comfortable. And that one that we were looking at, we don't talk about it very much because it broke down in the first days. Uh, we use it all the time. A lot of us are addicted to uh, vitamin I, we call it. <laughs> um, it breaks down very quickly in the body. So that wasn't one that we had to worry about. Just to recap, um, so composting done properly is safe for humans. We want to make sure they're placed right. We want to use good carbon. Uh, we want to place the animal in the pile so that it's um, surrounded, enveloped by carbon. We may want to rub to break the skin and the bag, you know, the, the rumen and stomach so that they don't explode. And we want to allow, this is what we're trying to accomplish in composting versus making silage. We want to have as much air flowing around that animal as possible. And sometimes we can make too much air go around the animal. But for the most part, most farmers don't. And I'll just quick example. DOT learned to compost in two years. Why? Because they have chips and dead deer. Those are their two ingredients. Farms are taking a long time to do it because they're using a lot of on-farm material and it's all different densities. And that's where it becomes more problematic. The more we can do to, to uh, keep the air flowing around those carcasses, the better we're going to be able to do. Um, so quick, so we, minute or two? I just don't want to go over. Um, some best management practices. We can use filter strips. So right here. Um, we just put a pile of compost down slope of where that is. Uh, berms, socks. Um, this could be in, in socked material. We also use berms, let me just describe this one. This is a compost facility and there are berms all the way around it because it's at the bottom of the hill. So we have berms around it so we don't have to handle all of that water. All that water just goes around and into the streams that are right down here. We've, in 20 years, we've never had a pollution problem with any of that. We have leachate collection here, so there's a lagoon there. And <coughs> this is just a, a cloth and gravel pad there. We also like to encourage for mortality composting that we do it on a, a soil surface. And we keep vegetation on the surface and have it mowed because it takes up those extra nutrients. We don't want to have something like this, and I know we've all seen this, when we've gone out in the field, just a big amorphous pile that's not going to allow that air to flow into the pile. And I think, and that's it. This is just how we're using some of that compost. So we hydro seeded, and three months later, we had grass. Thank you very much, Steve.